Returning to Udon, though, I hope you are prepared, because I think my hottest take ever might be here. Hello, my fellow wannabe straw hats, and welcome back to the One Piece saga, where today we will be continuing our way through the wackiness that is Act 2 of Wano. Last time, in a twist that made me fly out of my seat, we already saw Luffy clash with Kaido, which ended in him being annihilated and marking his first defeat against the Emperor. So today, we'll be picking up with his imprisonment in Udon. And without further ado, let us jump right into Wano. But Act 2 this time. Alright, before we properly get going, because Act 2 has a ton of stories going on in tandem, for simplicity's sake, I may talk about a few things out of order here and there, so don't be too surprised if I jump around a lot, basically. This part of Wano definitely has the most things going on at the same time, so it can get a little bit hard to follow otherwise. That said, with the opening of Act 2, we primarily focus on assembling the raid on a whole bunch of fronts. And while most of it was really cool, I specifically want to mention Ashura here, because like I said last time, I think he was an incredibly interesting character in this entire rebellion against Kaido. Usually with these sorts of stories where you have prophecies of saviors and whatnot, everyone welcomes them with open arms and it's more so an information problem rather than a convincing one. Which, in part, is also what we see here. It's not a case of trying to convince anyone, they simply hand out the coded flyers and everyone already knows what's up. But in the middle of all of that, we have Ashura, someone who saw the country fall into ruin, someone who saw people starve around him, Someone who saw basically everything just wither away for literal decades. And so, once Kinemon and the others show up, the only question he has is, why did it take you so long? In storytelling, I think it's super easy for us as the readers or viewers to be like, well, it's a prophecy, surely you must trust it and you can affect it, right? We just scoot all that tragedy under the rug because, hey, it's a prophecy, right? It must be right. But from Ashura's perspective, and just from a realistic point of view, whatever this prophecy was, why would you be loyal to it if it meant that, let's be honest, thousands of people have either died, been in prisons, or like in the case of Ebisu Town, have had their lives ruined forever? I think I have to once again bring up Avatar in this case, because of course I do, as there too we saw very similar themes. After Aang returned, people didn't wait for him with open arms. Rather, many blamed him for disappearing in the first place, even if it wasn't really his fault. And I just really love the fact that Oda took a much more mature approach of portraying these sorts of loyalties among the people of Wano, where some had indeed been loyal and patiently waiting for their true leader to return, while others, if not hated them for leaving, then were at least apprehensive about just throwing themselves behind them in support. So yeah, big big W there. On a lighter, but not really lighter note, one thing that I found a ton of fun was Sanji's little soba stance. I didn't notice it as much on initial viewing, but in retrospect, I think Wano had a lot of incredible moments for Luffy and Zoro, but the rest of the crew was largely underutilized. Something we'll be returning to plenty more later on as well. But as far as Sanji goes, the banter they have with Toko was just super wholesome and I found myself smiling the whole way through. And yes, once again, I know her name is actually Toko, but I'm sorry, it just sounds really, really weird in English because it kind of sounds like Latvian because Latvian is also a phonetic language, just like Japanese. But it sounds like really, really weird for me to mix in my native language, which isn't actually my native language, it just sounds like my native language and basically, it sounds weird, so I'm just going to keep calling her Toko and don't worry about it. Yeah, with that out of the way, especially with how unexpectedly dark this arc would get in just a moment, I think this was a really nice breather moment where it really was as simple as just enjoying a nice bowl of soba. And yes, I know it's not soba, it's soba. Don't at me. In many ways, as simple as the scene is, I think it just goes to speak a lot about the bigger story of Wano and living under Kaido. Because it's these little wins throughout the day that remind you of the better times. While they're at Sanji's stand, nothing has changed. Wano is still ravaged by his war machine, the smile fruits have ruined many lives and things are not exactly great. But at this moment, it's just that bowl of noodles that sparks a smile. And I for one, love that little detail, especially in retrospect. Cutting to Udon, as I very much expected, we basically see Luffy and Kid just try to one-up each other in basically every single way possible. 
And I'll say it right now, with the raid very much being the Sab Odi gang back together, I was already super excited to see how Kid would play into the rest of Wano. Especially with him already having fought Shanks and losing an arm in the process. And the fact that this is just a throwaway line had me scratching my head a little, as I definitely want to know what happened there. But hey, it's not like I didn't warn you, Mr. Eustace Kid. Considering what we saw in Marineford, I just don't see them taking on Shanks. Sure, we don't really know how strong they've become either, but let's be real, Shanks has way more allies, way more experience, and basically more of everything. So yeah, good luck boys. Jokes aside, as far as Luffy's story goes, number one, we see that the Swamp Snake dude is here too, which again, judging by how this arc would end, has me seriously thinking that our little Swamp Boy might turn out to be a crucial puzzle piece in the bigger story. Because I seriously find it very odd that he just so happens to overhear and learn of incredibly important things right alongside Luffy. If I had to make a guess, I wouldn't at all be surprised if he is a part of Blackbeard's crew. Take Return to Sabaody. There he was ready to join up with the fake straw hats just because of their notoriety. And then there's Blackbeard, someone who is explicitly looking around for powerful crewmates. Makes sense if you ask me, especially with how versatile the Swamp Boy's fruit actually turned out to be, so I don't know, maybe that. Oh, and the whole scene of Snakey Boy asking Luffy for forgiveness, only for him to say, well, if you've changed then there's no problem, is the most Luffy thing ever, and I love it. But number two, we see Luffy meet the absolute legend that is the Flower Gramps. I've almost certainly talked about this before, but I absolutely love these sorts of deceptively powerful archetypes and our Flower Gramps is very much that. We'll talk about it plenty more later on, but even before knowing that he was the leader of the Yakuza, which frankly was more than hinted at with his tattoo, since this is obviously Japanese culture and tattoos are very taboo. But yeah, I immediately knew that he'd be our Uncle Iroh for this arc, and I was not disappointed at all. Oh, and um, YouTube tells me a lot of you aren't subscribed, and it also tells me that if I ask you nicely, you might. So, um, subscribe and like the video, please. It helps a lot. Susan, is this really necessary? Meanwhile, on Zoro's side, we see him meet Tonoyasu, who too is an extremely joyous lad, and yes, I'll use this meme as much as I can because it literally describes my entire feelings on this little sub-arc. Though yeah, very similar to Luffy and Otsuma, we see Zoro brought to Ebisu Town, where even more of the darkness behind Wano is slowly revealed. And the quote I wrote down here specifically was, Humans are the only species who can laugh, so why not laugh? Especially with scenes like them spending their hard-earned money on clean water and joyfully giving it to the stranger that is Zoro, I think everyone watching these scenes knew full well that there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than we know. There is smiling in the face of hardship, and then there is this. For me, the scenes in Ebisu Town fell right into that uncanny valley where you know something is off, but don't quite know why. And then, with the reveal of the smile fruits, obviously all of that is completely recontextualized and suddenly brings up countless questions about their true feelings at many given moments. And hold that thought for a second. Cutting to Chopper, we see him train with Otama, which is literally the most wholesome thing I've ever seen in my life, and of course I have to mention it. But another huge development that's still going on in the background of all of this is Big Mom 2 going after Luffy, and that is exactly what we see here. We do see her clash with King and stuff for a bit, but point is, just like Luffy, she falls into the whirlpool and gets washed up on the shore, where our little boy Chopper finds her and then proceeds to lose his mind out of sheer terror. And oh boy, this is something I have very, very mixed feelings on. On one hand, I hate how cheap the memory loss trope is, and it's literally the only thing moving the story forward in this case. It almost feels like Oda just needed to stall the Kaido Big Mom alliance so that Luffy's training and the whole rising up to the raid deal makes sense. And so what we got was just a, well, Big Mom forgot. So on that basis, I won't lie, this did feel super cheap. But that is my critical brain, because my emotional brain was like, yeah, you know what, sure, it's not like she ever really made sense. Most of the raid would also be plenty of Big Mom shenanigans where she flip-flops between being a pseudo-ally to a full-on baddie and rinse and repeat. And on top of that, even back in Whole Cake Island, she just wanted to keep Brooke as basically a toy? So frankly, I didn't even find this that unbelievable. 
And perhaps most importantly, it gave us some incredibly amusing interactions between her and Chopper, so I kind of want to pardon it for that alone. And then there's also the bigger story at play, where I think Big Mom's territory was explicitly meant to mirror Kaido's, which both depicts why we haven't seen these sorts of alliances before and why the whole conflict between them would be back in full swing again. Big Mom's land was a paradise of food, Kaido's is a ravaged wasteland. And this will also be mentioned later with a particular Dwayne The Rock's D. Johnson, so we'll get to that in due time. And so all of that said, frankly, I'm not too sure how I feel about this all things considered. Memory loss is always kind of a cheap way of going about things, but I guess the sheer chaos that came out of it made up for it for me at least. What I have zero mixed feelings on and just straight up hate is what happens on our Soba Noodle side. One of Kaido's dino boys goes after Sanji and we basically see them throw down and while all of that is cool, Sanji then whips out his power up in a can or in other words his raid suit. Now, before all the Sanji stands start writing even more essays, this is not a dunk on Sanji because, as I've said before, his dripped out suits are usually one of my favorite designs in the series. Seriously, his raid suit... I just realized how dumb this sounds if you can't see what I'm talking about, but yes, his suit at the end of the arc during the Kaido raid was absolutely awesome. But then here, he opens up his clown jar and becomes a budget Power Ranger with a 2001 Jetix cartoon protagonist hairstyle with some clown shoes to top it all off. So yeah, design-wise, I am sorry Oda, this one is a 0 out of 10. I do find the whole Sanji always ends up being someone he doesn't want to deal a pretty cool little detail though. His first bounty was that horrifying image of Duval, then there's him being Vinsmoke Sanji, and now when he just wants to be a Soba man, he turns into the stealth clown. So in that sense, I guess it's pretty cool, but like, I'm sorry, I despise the raid suit and it being destroyed made me almost as happy as finding out Absalom is dead. Usually I'm on the side of Usopp nerding out about giant mechs and whatnot, but I'm sorry, this ain't it, chief. The raid suits are clown suits, they will never look neither good nor cool, and no one can change my mind on that. And speaking of things that no one can change my mind on, there is Orochi, who immediately shot up to be one of the most hateable villains in all of One Piece. And that's even before we learn the whole history behind him. Honestly, in a weird way, I kind of feel sad that I binged through the entirety of Wano because I never really dwelled on him that much since Kaido was always the big boss of this whole ordeal, and Orochi was kind of overshadowed by him for me. Purely out of curiosity, do let me know whether this is just a binging thing, or did you also think he was pushed to the wayside by Kaido even on initial reading slash watching? And I also wonder whether that's just a byproduct of how ridiculously packed this arc is toward the end. Because in hindsight, for me, Orochi and the personal quabbles of Wano really feel like something that should have been tackled separately from Kaido. Whereas here, we sorta kinda did both at once and clearly, the big bad emperor took front stage. But yeah, in story, here we see the big twist of Hiyori being quote unquote killed by the blue Josuke hair dude and the Orochi drama continues. We then cut to the Prophet Dude and Drake who are both looking for Sanji and their search takes them to a bathhouse where, surprising nobody, Sanji is once again a creep as usual. I'm already looking forward to all the Sanji stands jumping up and saying, Oh, Kuroto's mid-shack who fell off, that was an all-gender bath, he wasn't creeping at all. But like, come on, stop it with the mental gymnastics. If anything, this whole thing just made me disappointed in how quickly he just seems to have gotten over his whole I'm not a Vinsmoke and I won't use the raid suit unless it means saving my friends. And as I say that, I can already imagine the Well, he was there as a distraction. If he wasn't there, Nami and Robin would have died a horrible death and whatnot. Because, you know, it's, it's not like Robin has been running away from the world government her, literally her entire life. You know, yeah, Sanji was definitely necessary there. But yeah, I'll just leave it at that and rather focus on the handful of excellent scenes Sanji gets later on. TLDR, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed, Sanji. Very, very disappointed. And because I've chosen chaos today, to trigger Sanji stands even more, what I'm not disappointed by is literally everything going on on Zoro's side, because sheesh. I really don't know whether I was just silly for not recognizing him or was that the point? But I never knew that it was supposed to be killer, so that alone was a super interesting twist. But as far as the fight goes, for me, this is 
easily my favorite Zoro fight, and frankly, it's not even close. First off, the fact that he uses two scythes is just the most menacing thing ever, and that alone already made him an incredible foe. Secondly, this whole thing takes place in the snowy region of Wano, so of course, snow and Pog with about 50 O's. Thirdly, this is the type of animation I am all here for. Sure, it was flashy, but for the most part, I think it was just the right amount of bombastic lights mixed with utter carnage as they literally ripped their surroundings apart. And what I loved the most on the animation front was the black and white moments they mixed in whenever Killer actually drew blood. I think it's just a really neat way of immediately grounding the fight, especially now that we have people literally zipping around three times the speed of light. It seriously makes me wish we got more of these sudden snaps to simplified or washed out colors to signify the toll the fight is taking on the characters, which is unfortunately not really the case in the big Kaido vs Luffy fights. But let's not jump ahead. And lastly, Zoro wielding the scythe as his third blade was so good. At the time of writing and recording, Zoro vs King still hasn't happened in the anime, but if this is the type of vibe we'll be getting, I think I can die happy. Returning to Udon though, I hope you are prepared because I think my hottest take ever might be here. Now, at this point, I don't know if I just hate fun or what, but I literally despise Queen. Like, seriously. I really, really hate Queen. And no, the Zoom Zoom song is not good and is straight up brainwashing. Not sure if it's a bad take or not, but I hate it. A lot. Though I do admit, I think dinosaurs are cool, and brontosauruses are really cool, but I'm sorry queen, my brutosaur, which I bought for a cool 5 million gold, is still cooler than you. Jokes aside, yeah, as far as queen's fruit power works, just like with Jack, I love the whole beast pirates vibe and how they are these overwhelmingly massive, well, beasts that overwhelm you with brute strength alone. It would result in a whole bunch of fun shenanigans during the raid, so we'll talk about that later on as well. But obviously, the most important detail here is Luffy's training. Number one, I love the world building that is done with Ryo. It's clearly just a specialized form of hockey, right? But it still has a completely different name, which makes perfect sense considering just how closed off Wano is. Language always seems to be one of those things that most stories completely forego for simplicity's sake. Like, think about it, when have you ever watched or read a fictional story where traveling across the world actually has a language barrier? I'm guessing not that many, so I just like that it was at least acknowledged here, even if it was very subtle. But yes, the whole Udon storyline was also just filled with incredible Luffy moments. Everything from him casually hockey blasting waves after waves of enemies and saying that it was too easy, to him standing up for the flower gramps, to all balloon Luffy making an appearance, all of this was a ton of fun. If I were to name one thing that I didn't really like is how straightforward it was, if that makes sense. On one hand, it's your typical training under a old and wise master mini-arc, so why would I complain? But at the same time, I've gotta be honest with you, Udon wasn't exactly the most exciting setting and despite it being this horrible prison, I never really felt like anyone was really in danger. This might be another case of me binging through the series and not really feeling the impact of Luffy's training as much, but it felt like the most dangerous part of Udon is those first 5 seconds of the one dream opening where we actually see Luffy chained up. Aside from that, he seemed to glide along fairly easily. Overall though, definitely a fun little mini arc and the animation depicting Ryo was incredible as usual. And also, the brief flashback to Rayleigh and their training was also really cool, and I seriously wish we get to see more of them, even if I don't think that will be the case judging by Luffy's final fight. But again, let's not rush ahead. All that said, like 20 minutes into the video, it is time for us to finally delve into the real meat and potatoes of Act 2, which, big surprise, was also by Miles my favorite portion of the act. After Zoro's fight against Killer, we see Hiyori nurse him back to health, where we also see a whole bunch of shenanigans with Toko, which was both wholesome as well as a ton of fun. And we also learn of Kappa. And I'll be blunt with you, Kappa is hands down my favorite of the scabbards, and it's not even a contest. His story of looking after little Hiyori after Momo and the others were sent to the future, his fighting style, his design, his slightly wacky personality, I love everything about him. 
But yeah, we'll talk about Kappa a whole bunch in just a second, so hold that thought for now. By miles, the biggest thing we learn here is that the raid has been leaked and everyone with the secret ankle tattoos are now being imprisoned. And I'll say it right now, I did not expect any of what happens here, because Yasu, the joyous man we saw with Zoro before, says the whole deal was a prank, that he made the flyers himself, and he basically becomes a martyr for Wano. And you probably expected this, but this is exactly why I've been saying the lack of deaths in One Piece sticks out like a sore thumb. I know a lot of people say that, yeah, well, Oda is saving them up for moments like this, but that's a pretty weak argument in my opinion, as deaths happen all the time in flashbacks, and have never detracted from the emotional impact of actually seeing them happen. At this point, whenever I see a flashback, I basically joke around about, yeah, we're going to see deaths, I expect them at this point. But still, the emotional impact is still there. So I can see why leveraging them as we see here in the present day doesn't happen more often. But during all of this, we also find out about the truth behind the smile fruits and suddenly everything fell right into place. Everything from Dofi's messed up era of smiles to killer and everything in between was suddenly flipped on its head. As far as reveals go, this one is right up there among my favorites just because of how drastically it recontextualizes basically everything we've seen before. And I think this is also one of those things that the anime elevated way beyond anything that a paper manga could ever do. That scene of Zoro getting angry as everyone around him bursts out in laughter to the point that it feels almost suffocating, only for Hiyori to break down saying that they are not laughing. They are all crying, was the most horrific scene in a long, long time. There is a reason why unnatural smiles are so uncanny and are often leveraged for horror, right? And I think Oda managed that absolutely wonderfully here. The sheer number of emotions all clashing as Yasuo is sentenced to death is incredible. And as much as it hurt my poor little heart, I don't think you'll be surprised when I say that this is one of my favorite moments of both Wano as well as the story as a whole. I love myself a good tragedy, and this one was a absolutely messed up one. And Toko running with that huge grin as her father just dies is oh boy. TLDR, give me more messed up tragedies, blast me right in the feels, and no more immortality, thank you very much. And then that scene of Zoro and Sanji both jumping in, pure brilliance. Just like with someone getting Luffy's straw hat, when Zoro and Sanji are fighting side by side, you know things are getting very serious, and I loved every second of it. Meanwhile at Udon, after witnessing Yasu's death, things continue escalating there too, and all of that is turned up to 11 as Big Mom 2 arrives at Udon. Again, we get to see plenty of chopper shenanigans here, which were also a ton of fun, but put briefly, all hell breaks loose and a battle royale of sorts begins. There are frankly too many incredible shots in here to mention as our flower gramps pushes Luffy to trust himself and master Ryo, so I'll just say once again, if the animation style ever switches back after Wano, I will cry tears saltier than the grand line itself. And one quick thing that I loved here was the reunion between Killer and Kid, which when I was watching through Wano for the first time, basically confirmed my little, oh, the Sabody gangs back together theory, as Kid 2 was now very much fueled by revenge. And in the meantime, the aforementioned legend Kappa is also freed. So we see him join the battle, and then there's Kiku who also begins making moves, and generally, all of this was just a ton of fun. But my favorite part here, of course, comes from our little rubber boy, as the whole plague thing happens, but Luffy fights through all of it, just pushing on and saying, you're given enough to not die, and you call that living? You guys are nothing but slaves. Oh boy, I love this so much. The whole speech Luffy goes on, basically telling them, I don't care what you want, I made a promise to Otama that I'll transform this country, and that is exactly what I'll do. Obviously we'd see the absolute climax of this in Kaido's fights, but clearly, Luffy's story has always been about freeing people. He always talks about being the most free and how that's the most important part, right? And then here he is, arriving on this land which has seen nothing but devastation and oppression for over two decades. And sure, he might come off as harsh, but he makes his intention clear. No matter how hard, he will change this place. So yeah, Luffy here is once again an absolute legend. 
And no, that's not even the end of it, because as he finally collapses and Chopper gets to brewing up the antidote, Momo and Otama arrive as well. And surprise surprise, we get yet another incredible scene as Luffy once again pushes himself up and screams at Momo that his people are waiting for him. And yes, I know I'm saying this a lot with Wano, but that's just how the story is in this one. The whole Momo carrying the weight of this country on his small and experienced shoulders would be another tragedy of this entire arc, which we will get to much much more with the climax of the raid. So for now, I'll just say that, yeah, if you ever want to be a leader of a nation, get someone like Luffy by your side. The dude may be a goofball, but as long as you keep him well fed, he'll be your greatest advisor of all time. Though despite Yasu's sacrifice, the heroic proclamations of Momo, and the build-up to the Grand Raid, the plan was still leaked, right? For those of you who've been following my journey, you already know exactly what I'm going to bring up, don't you? Yes, I was ready to run laps around everyone who said that Law wasn't sussy because I thought that finally, one of my legit theories would finally turn out to be true. To me, despite his clearly tragic backstory, I still thought that Law was a little too complex, if that makes sense. And clearly, everything he was doing here was purposely dubious and I thought that finally, I had cracked the mystery. By the looks of it, a whole bunch of the worst generation were already allied with Kaido, and Law immediately threw out Kaido as a target back in Punk Hazard. So maybe this whole deal was to lure Luffy here. But yeah, no. I was laughably wrong yet again, and frankly, I will take this massive L and finally admit that all of my Law conspiracies were silly. Returning to more sensible matters, we have another case of Wano just casually subverting anything and everything, because seriously, the story we see with the Graveyard of Swords is excellent. If I watched this without having any idea that this is a part of One Piece, I'd eat it up without giving it a second thought. And unfortunately, I think this is also the part that hurts the most. I absolutely adored learning more about the history of Wano, Ryuma's history and the history of his sword, the Guardian deity, and basically every single thing here. But I think there was a severe lack of exploration of how Zoro fits into all of that. When we first heard that we are headed to Wano, I fully expected it to be the Zoro arc through and through, akin to Sanji and Whole Cake Island. And while in many ways, I do think that Zoro is probably the most crucial player here aside from Luffy, I still think there could have been so, so much more. But yeah, it's not just the story and the relationship between Kappa and Onimaru that deserves praise here, because the cinematography here is also top-notch. Even the small things like occasionally adding those cinematic black bars, slightly desaturating the colors to emphasize the somber nature of the flashback, literally everything here was excellent. And then when Zoro comes into all of that and we see the fox finally move on, Oh, I was glued to my screen to the point that I barely have any notes from this. Okay, it's not like I have no notes, I do have Snow and Pog with about 50 O's. Jokes aside, this is unfortunately one of those things that just seems rushed in hindsight, as we never really linger on Zoro going to Ryuma's grave or anything like that. We see them get the swords for the raid, we hear of Odin's two swords, which we'll talk about in a second, and we basically move on right away. But that aside, easily one of my favorite parts of Wano, and yes, I know I've said that about 50 million times, sue me. Okay, and one more thing that actually happened before all of this I have to mention, the entire length of time before they actually get the swords and Zoro is in that autumn vibe region of Wano is also complete perfection. Like for real, this shot of the lanterns rising up in the night is perfect and please, I need a print of this on my wall, like right now. Calling it now, Return to Wano is happening, and it is happening soon. And yes, Kappa will be there, along with Ghost Girl and Hawkeye, because let's be honest, that is literally all we need to make One Piece perfect. On the side of Big Mom and Kaido, without getting too caught up in the details of it all, we basically see them compete to see who the bigger Chad is and just straight up throw down for a minute or two. Of course, seeing two stupidly powerful emperors just flex on each other was some good fun, and certainly made me extremely excited to see Luffy face off against not one, but two emperors at the same time. And again, the animation here literally gave me goosebumps on initial viewing. Like, how can you look at the shot of them at Onigashima and not think that this is going to be the most hype arc of all? 
Returning to the crew, we finally see all of them meet back up and everything is moving forward to carry out the raid on Onigashima. We have our two tanks, we have our healers, we have our DPS, and most importantly, our raid leader is also here. And while the preparations are going on, Odin's swords are also properly unveiled, as Ame no Habakiri is given to Momo while Enma is given to Hiyori. And with her deeming Zoro worthy, she passes on Enma to him as replacement for Ryuma's blade. I won't lie, my monkey brain had a big flare up when we see Zoro just accidentally slice off an entire mountain using it. But it does make me wonder what's going to happen once all three of Zoro's swords are forged by a single person. Clearly, we've already seen that craftsmanship has a much deeper meaning in the One Piece universe. So I wonder whether there's some hidden art that Zoro will unlock once he taps into the blacksmith's energy or something along those lines. And as is trend with One Piece, there's also the entire fate aspect, as these blades were apparently forged by Kuina's grandfather, which just makes my head spin as to how Zoro's sword mastery will manifest, but for the millionth time, we'll have ample time to talk about all of my tinfoil during the raid, so that's where I'll leave it for now. Put briefly, our raid team is assembled and we are basically ready to head off, which also marks the end of Act 2. But again, not this video because we still have the interlude to talk about, and I'll say it right now. This interlude literally has some of the greatest animation of the entire series, and for me, it easily stands up there with episode 1015 in terms of quality. Obviously, the events themselves are also pretty mind-boggling, but for real, the shading here is something else entirely. Imagine dropping One Piece because it looks outdated early on and missing out on this. But anyway, first off, we hear that Sabo is apparently dead, which convincing nobody is resolved by the end of the arc, so we'll delve into that there. But secondly, and this will nicely lead us into Act 3, we hear a frankly ridiculous amount of lore about Garp's past, the God Valley incident, the legendary Rocks Pirates, the current bounties of all the Emperors, past Emperors, and basically anything you would ever want to know. As far as the bounties go, I've already said this before, but I think because I've binged through the series so fast, they don't really carry the same weight for me as I think many other readers. And so while finding out Rogers, Shanks's, and Whitebeard's bounties was definitely interesting, I didn't really think about them that much. I'm pretty sure I've also talked about this before, but I'm still low-key confused what to draw from the bounties as when I first began the series, I just thought that it was your convenient way of power scaling. But then as we got deeper into the series, that was sort of disproven by the likes of Kid Robin, who had a ridiculous bounty because of the things she knew and not really her strength. But then when I see these bounties, I find it sort of odd that somebody like Big Mom and Kaido have lower bounties than Whitebeard, as based on what I've seen so far at least, I think they're always doing very very bad piratey things, while Whitebeard seem to be more laid back. Obviously, he is still a pirate and he was Roger's number one rival for a reason after all, but it just seemed like he didn't get into too much trouble with the navy. But then again, he did also control Fishman Island, which was arguably one of the most crucial territories in the Grand Line, so I really don't know. But yeah, for the millionth time, this too we'll discuss after the raid as the five elder clowns would make another wacky move that makes me raise an eyebrow big time. As for Rox and the God Valley incidents, my knee-jerk reaction was always that Rox is a past version of Blackbeard akin to Roger Luffy. Especially with Rox's whole deal being assembling such powerful pirates that they couldn't even properly fight side by side. Which, at least for me, I think also neatly fits with Blackbeard's current crew. Considering Roger teamed up with Garp to stop him, clearly something ridiculously bad must have gone down there, right? What's a really really bad thing in the world that we know of right now? The Ancient Weapons. And who happens to be a sussy agent that just so happens to overhear information about the Ancient Weapons? The Snaky Swamp Boy. So, if he were to be an agent of Blackbeard, I do think that we could see history repeat itself and see Luffy ally up with Kobe to take him down. Which would also send ripples throughout the world because it's a marine and a notorious pirate fighting side by side just like we saw back then. 
then again, judging by the Kaido fight, I also don't think naming it God Valley is a coincidence, which is further compounded by Roger's story we get throughout the third act. Which makes me wonder whether the God Valley incident was rather a turning point in Roger's life, where he found out something crucial about Joy Boy, which then led him to Laugh Tale, which then resulted in everything we'd see during the raid. Point is, because Rox is also of the D lineage, whatever the answer here might be does leave my head spinning. Not helped by the fact that Blackbeard has named his little raft after Rox. And as if all of that wasn't enough, Rox's flag literally has horns. Basically all the flags we've seen so far express something crucial about the captain. And the only exceptions, Blackbeard and Rox. I've talked about Blackbeard already and how I think it symbolizes him getting a third fruit, but Rox is having literal devil horns when we have devil fruits in the series, I think speaks volumes as to how important I think he actually is. If I had to throw out a couple of completely wild guesses, I'd say one, maybe the two horns actually transform into the heads and Blackbeard is sort of your second incarnation of Rox. Or number two, I'd say that he is also in some way linked to, big surprise, Davy Jones, otherwise known as the Sailor's Devil. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I am sort of running out of tinfoil here, and luckily, Wano is already over. So, I'll go get some more and delve into all of this sometime while we wait for the next arc to wrap up instead. But yes, that is Act 2. Again, no tier list just yet, but I will extremely quickly give my overall thoughts on the act as a whole because we've already been here for way too long. TLDR, I loved it. It had its ups and downs, sure, I wasn't the biggest fan of the Udon sub-arc for example, but overall, I absolutely adore Wano as a setting and hope, I mean, I definitely know, will be returning here very, very soon. But with that, I hope to see you next time as One Piece just decided to shove Rogers' story into my face without ever warning me and I almost died. So I hope you look forward to that. And that's the video. Well, this one did turn out to be an absolute chonker, but what can I say? I love myself some Wano. All that said, as usual, I want to give a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. And patrons, I'm working on getting my Act 3 reactions up ASAP, so keep an eye out for that. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye